Um, welcome everybody. My name is Nicole Haar and I'm going to be your hospitality host for this session. You have joined us for talking about PKD patients and caregivers share experiences talking with friends and family. I am really excited to introduce our panel to you. I'm not going to tell you uh, very much about them because I'm going to let them do that. But we have with us Ann Bartels, Laura Macklin, Ed and Kathy McVeigh, and Nancy Kaminsky is also with us, and she's going to be our moderator for this session. So, Nancy, it is my pleasure to turn this over to you. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, my name is Nancy Kaminsky, and I am a PKD Foundation volunteer with the Pittsburgh chapter. I'm also a PKD patient and a transplant recipient with a multi-generational family history of PKD. Our panel this afternoon is here to talk about how they've shared their story of PKD with family or friends. There's no right or wrong way. It's a very individual thing for a long time. Um, I didn't tell my story. Um, my kids always say I came out of the closet about it. Um, it's very individual and very personal, and none of us are experts, but we hope to help you find your own way to share your story and talk to family and friends about PKD. I'd like to start our discussion with Ann Bartels, who says she has always been very open about PKD. Ann? Hi. So I'm going to start with saying I'm not a public speaker, so please be kind. Um, PKD has been in my family as far as three generations back that I can find out. Um, my mother was diagnosed first. Uh, she had it, she knew she had it for probably 20 years before her mother was diagnosed. And so I think I heard another family saying that. And then uh, she was probably diagnosed when I was about 10 years old. And so we always talked very openly about it. You know, we didn't want, my mom didn't want us to be scared about it. So it was something that we talked openly. We talked about it at the dinner table. We talked about it when her cysts would pop and she'd be in bed on antibiotics for a couple of days. And so she always raised us, which I'm following her lead as treat us as we have it and hope that we don't. And so my sister was diagnosed probably in her twenties. My brother was diagnosed also in his 20s, and I really thought I had dodged the bullet. I'd had a child at 30, and then I had my second child at 32, and my blood pressure went out of whack, and I got tested, and I had it. And so I was the last child that got diagnosed. So my mom had three children. Four of us got it. And so I was a young mom with two kids, and I, my kids have been raised with it. Unfortunately, I lost my mom when my firstborn was 10 months old, and so we never really got to know her. But I have just raised my family the same way. I talk about it with my friends. I talk about it with my family. I talk about it with anybody who will listen, my coworkers. I'm not ashamed of it. It's something that we have to deal with and grow with. I don't consider it a death sentence at all. Um, I'm living a very life and full life. I continue to work full time. I continue to take care of my kids. I'm married. And so if anyone's willing to listen, I'm willing to share my, share my story with them. And so my sister was transplanted probably about eight years ago. And so she had to get a liver transplant and a kidney transplant. My brother is trying to get on the list. I'm on the list for kidney transplant and a liver transplant because it affected um, our livers also, unfortunately, but I think it's very, very common. And so I'm living life on the list. Everybody knows about it. My boss knows about it. My kids know about it. My friends and family know about it. Um, we're all just kind of hoping for my day to come. Um, I'm kind of raising my kids. They have not been tested. I am not stopping them from getting tested. I'm not encouraging them to get tested. I'm just raising them as they have it. Um, I'm discouraging the high energy drinks, the high salt intake meals. Um, but yeah, it's just a very open book at our house. It's never been anything that we've hidden. It's never been anything that um, we've even tried to hide. And so it's just how I live. Thanks, Ann. Our um, next 
people on the panel to speak are Ed and Kathy McVeigh, and they're here to share with us the shock they experienced when they found out that their daughter had PKD. Kathy and Ed? Thank you, Nancy. Hi. Can everybody, Hi. Hear, can you hear us? Yes. Okay, good, thanks. <laughs> uh, Kathy and I are active in the uh, Milwaukee chapter of the PKD. Uh, and we were asked to join this panel because our daughter uh, has a deep PKD. She was diagnosed uh, seven years ago when she had just graduated from college, and it was quite by accident. She had been having some internal issues. Uh, the doctor was actually looking for an ulcer and uh, discovered that she had PKD. To the best of our knowledge, we had no family history of it. Um, the only thing in hindsight is that she had been being treated for high blood pressure, which we always thought was odd, um, but we never jumped to a conclusion. So um, that's uh, basically how we got started with, uh, with it and how we came to uh, the knowledge that she had a spontaneous uh, mutation. So um, we were shocked. Uh, we were in disbelief. We were scared. Um, we felt helpless. And um, at that point, and we do, we do have another child. We have a son who's a couple of years younger than her. Um, but as a family, we decided that we would uh, try to learn everything we could um, that's not too scientific over our heads, but we learn everything we could about the disease. And if you plan on telling people about your diagnosis, you're going to want to know some things about it because they're going to ask questions. They're going to ask a lot of questions. And so we turned to a nephrologist and uh, the most helpful thing was the PKD Foundation, the people in the Milwaukee chapter. Uh, have been incredible in helping us understand and learn um, a lot about PKD. So, yeah. Um, so once once we uh, uh, decided that we would learn as much as we could, uh, and of, of course uh, Nicole and everybody in the uh, PKD Foundation office in Kansas City are just an amazing resource, as is the website. But um, we decided that we would start with our family, immediate family, and we, we did tell them in a one-on-one -on -one situation wherever possible, uh, at, at the very least a phone call, uh, but we did try to do it in person, one-on-one. -on -one. <clears throat> um, so we did that, and then we really let Meredith direct uh, our daughter, direct whether or not she wanted to discuss it with friends, extended acquaintances, neighbors, things like that. Employer. Employer. And she was had made the decision that she was 100% comfortable with being open, talking about it, trying to learn as much as we could, maybe helping others uh, that had it as well. So um, once she decided that, uh, we, we started visiting one-on-one -on -one with extended family and extended friends and neighbors. And so we, we did um, sort of extend the circle out. And whenever we talked to people, we tried to do it one-on-one -on -one, um, so we could answer their questions there. They always wanted to know, uh, what's this mean for Meredith and how can I help? Um, and the, it's very touching that, you know, people that you know, really want to help you when you come across something that's as important, you know, in your life as this big change was in our, in our lives for our family. So with that, we, uh, we really started uh, because of their, everybody would say, what can we do? Is there a way we can help? We had people say, can we donate a kidney? Um, it's pretty amazing um, and touching. <laughs> And, and that moved us forward into doing more fundraising. So we've been really active in raising funds for the walk every year. Yeah, the walk has been a lot of fun for us. Uh, we've had family, friends, 
pretty big groups come and join us, 20, 30, 40 people one year. Um, and we've uh, been successful in, in helping uh, uh, with the fundraising uh, for research. And we've helped people that uh, we didn't know had PKD. So now we, what we do when we talk with people um, is we try to keep them updated on the progress, the things we learn about at meetings um, and uh, at conferences like this. So we hope one day to be able to share the news that there's been a cure found. So Great. Thank you, Ed and Kathy. Um, and how is Meredith doing now? Very well. Good. Good. Okay. Um, our next speaker is Laura Macklin. And Laura was diagnosed in her 20s. And with her diagnosis came fear for her future, which I think a lot of us can probably relate to us. She will share with us how she became an open and honest advocate for research. Laura? Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining. I'm going to share my screen so you have some more fun images to look at besides me. So I think we should be sharing now. You can hopefully see my little cutie patootie. This is our son, Miles. Um, this is probably when he was four and um, I was obviously diagnosed and I shamelessly used him um, for fundraising in the walks and um, putting stickers on him, as you can see, and any swag I could put on him to share my story. Um, so I'm going to, there'll be some slides rolling, running through here of just some, um, as I talk about my history here, um, I'll start that in a moment. But um, I was diagnosed, uh, like they said, in the, my early 20s. My father, uh, we've traced it back to my grandfather and my father um, by a routine sort of physical found out he had it. So by that time um, he was well married and um, um, that we have four kids in our family. I was the youngest of four and me and my older sister both have PKD and um, my other sister and my brother do not. So I, I was nervous, I was scared. I was in a serious relationship. Um, I didn't know if the, uh, my, uh, my boyfriend at the time, Marcus would wanna stay with me and, and have kids and all these things kept running through my head, of course. And so I was scared. So I dove in straight head first and tried to learn as much as I could. I am thankful, I'll, I'll skip ahead a little bit. We have been married for 25 years and have our beautiful son. So he did stick around, thank goodness. Um, and he has been my supporter along the way, 100% along with my family. Um, so I have been in a healthcare family and I've always heard about advocating and speaking up for yourself. So I think that is in my DNA as an individual, but I will selfishly say that I did this for me. I needed to be a part of the foundation, the, the PKD foundation. I am truly honored to be in a city like Seattle where there is a lot of kidney um, uh, research going on with the Kidney Research Institute. Um, with Northwest Kidney Centers, and I've, I've just dived headfirst into that. So that, that's kind of going from early on to now, but I needed to talk about it. I needed people to be aware. I needed to meet others. And so social media, um, I needed some mental and emotional peace of mind. And I had to be careful with social media because you can't believe everything you see, but I wanted to share my story with others and so that people knew, so that they could, they could see me who, for, her, who, for who I was, what I was going through, because as we all know, um, our disease isn't very physical sometimes. You could look at me and not know anything is wrong, but I could be having a really horrible day because of my PKD. And so I felt it was necessary for me to share that story. I'm gonna start my slideshow so you can see some more pictures. <laughs> And I believe it became very important um, for advocacy. So I would speak anytime and anywhere. So this is at a conference um, that we had. I set up tables at local places. This is all from the PKD Foundation. This is at a walk at a local um, kidney walk in our baseball field here. This is just information at any event that I could share and talk to people about. And so this became um, my thing. Um, the walk is huge. And so we always um, uh, held a walk for every year in Seattle here. Um, I think we've had as much as three or 400 people. And I'm gonna pause on this uh, picture. Hopefully it stops. So my father um, is the inspiration. My father um, turned 80, 
four, I think, Dad, if you're listening, uh, this past week, but in his mid 80s, my father does not have a transplant and has been never been on dialysis. And he is living the healthiest life. He runs every day. He, as you, this is a few years ago, but he looks just like this and he's amazing. And so that is um, inspiration for all of us. And I tell people that story all the time. Um, that it's very important to know that we all um, do this differently, uh, proceed through this differently. I also, my sister, who's um, uh, about six years older than me, um, did um, have to have a transplant, and that happened in, um, uh, in her 40s. And so I was convinced that I was going to also be able to have a preemptive transplant. And the, the good news there was my brother was the donor. So my sister got a preemptive transplant. She's 14 or 15 years now post-transplant and doing fantastic. She runs, she, uh, she rides a hundred mile bike rides up into the mountains of Colorado. She swims on a master swim team. She's a poster child for kidney health. Um, so very lucky, but I was convinced that then that would be me next. So my forties come along, I'm now 51 and nothing. I am sitting at stage four renal failure with giant cysts on my liver. I am uncomfortable. I am tired. I don't like to exercise as much as I used to. I'm sad, I get anxious, I'm depressed, and I want a transplant and I can't get it because I'm just not quite there yet. So these are the emotions that I have gone through from my 20s to my 50s and just trying to do everything I can to let people know how I feel without becoming too down on the situation. Um, I'm going to continue the slideshow here. So this is my family um, participating in one of the walks, my lovely parents, my son, Miles, here in his teens, I believe, me and my husband, Marcus, and my niece, Sarah, um, always had family at the walks. I live in Seattle. Um, I've been the Seattle chapter coordinator for five or six years now. My parents live in Iowa, so have really had a great support with um, folks coming to support us in the walk, which has been fantastic. This is my son's um, um, high school basketball team. And so again, as community awareness and speaking out, my, we've made sure that people know that Miles might have the disease. He has not been tested, but we are advocates for it. So the kids came out, this is his, like I said, high school basketball team and friends, and they earned community um, points, uh, service points for their graduation requirements. And so bringing out, again, teenagers who, who had no idea what this is. And I found out the next day after this walk, this picture was taken, that a lot of the kids wore their t-shirts to school. And um, it was just amazing. I was like, and you know, they're just a great group of kids. We're very lucky and very supportive because again, we don't know if Miles has it or not. Similar to um, Anne's story. I do uh, 5K runs or walks and I always wear my NPK t-shirt. I wear buttons on my coat when I'm um, out on the link light rail. I post on social media, anything that I can um, to let people know. I went to Olympia and advocated um, for uh, Northwest Kidney Centers. And I often take all the great paraphernalia and uh, information like this and bring this um, to social media and let people know. But one of the best things that I've ever done in the last five or more years, and I think there's a couple people on the call today, is uh, the PKD coffee chats. We used to do these in person, and now we do them virtually uh, due to COVID. And I think the virtual has actually been much more productive in some ways. But we meet every single month for one hour, sometimes two, on a call like this, and we talk to each other. And we just talk. We talk about our problems, our issues. Um, we, talk, we share good things and bad things, and it's just a very safe space. And um, the foundation had set this up for us, and uh, they log us in, and we just talk. So I highly recommend any other chapters out there, or if you don't know, get involved with one or join our Seattle one. We can do this virtually, so you don't have to live in Seattle to join our Seattle chapter. And then lastly, um, I just want to sort of wrap up um, uh, with one more photo, because my son just turned 25, I'm sorry, 21. Oh my gosh, I just, 21 this last Tuesday. He's happy, he's healthy, uh, bought his first drink on his own. And um, I do this for him. I speak for him. I hope there'll be a cure one day, but I'll do everything in my power to make sure that research and funding is possible um, to find a cure. There you go. Thank you, Laura. That's a great story you have. You've been quite the advocate. And um, I like the idea of the, the group, the monthly meetings with your group. I think that's something we could use here in Pittsburgh. Um, 
I think we're going to go to questions at this point. Uh, Nicole, can you help me out with that? You're on mute, Nicole. I am so sorry. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> sorry. It's amazing that that still happens after so many Zoom calls. Sorry about that. Um, I'm seeing some comments um, in the in there, not in the chat, but not specific questions. But um, one kind of uh, I think theme came up. We talked about support. Uh, Ed and Kathy mentioned that when they talk about PKD with their friends and neighbors and things like that, a lot of people want to know, first of all, how is Meredith doing? And second, how can we help? Um, and um, I'm just curious if any of you would want to comment about how you've built a, a, a support network and how that helps you feel comfortable about talking and sharing your PKD journey with others. Anybody want to jump in on that? Yeah, I, I can say a few words. Um, it's always been really important to share uh, family and friends and um, talk ab uh, openly about uh, PKD. There's some of my family members. So besides my, inter my immediate family I described, I had an aunt who died of, we didn't know at the time, but it was PKD. She had an aneurysm and her daughter has PKD. And then she has two kids that we don't know if they have it. And so it's there's there's some that will speak about it and openly and some that won't. But I feel like um, you have to be somewhat open or, or connect with somebody who is just for that awareness. And, um, and if we don't talk about things, we're not going to know to how to help. And so that, I think that's where uh, it's a strong um, power within me to say, we need that research. We need that money. If you follow any of these research and studies and use your own family even to help the researchers, you know, there's places we can donate our PKD kidneys once we do get a transplant and lucky enough, there are places that are doing studies. I am, I am donating my, my urine and my uh, DNA blood and every other, other thing that I can donate to help with studies as well. And I think all of that is really important for our friends and family to know that there are options out there, there's possibilities. And we can't just um, kind of sit back. We, we have to be our own advocates, um, especially for something like this that a lot of people have never even heard of. And there's so many of us suffering. Yeah, I would say, Nicole, sadly, one of the things, because it's not in our family and Meredith was a spontaneous mutation. I, you know, Ed's family is more involved in sharing the story. My family, not so much. Um, and we really would love that for them to, to share it more and, and try to reach out to people um, and let them know, because as Laura says, it's, you know, it's, it's not very, it hadn't been heard of a lot. Yes. I'm gonna jump on the bandwagon in regards to the studies. I have been involved at KU Med Center for, I guess, 20 years. And so as soon as I got diagnosed, my nephrologist referred me over to the university for PKD studies. And so I've kind of used it as a way to help find a cure. My goal has always been to find a cure so my kids don't have to deal with this disease. It's also uh, the PKD walk, the Kansas City walk. I haven't, I think I've missed one because I was in a wedding. Um, but for the last, since they started, I've been involved in the PKD walk. And so we bring a huge group. I have my aunts, my uncles, my cousins. We all come out of the woodwork. We all get matching t-shirts. Um, yeah, we, we try to be very, very involved. But I agree with Laura, we need to get in with the universities that are doing testing. And I, I, it's kind of almost free healthcare at the same time. You know, I get my labs done for free. I've gotten MRIs for free. And so it's a win-win. So you get to track your disease with the leading researchers out there, and you get to help find a cure. Very well said. Um, we have a, a really good question, and I want to get to that, but I just point out that what I've heard from all of our panelists, I think, is having a support network and how that has been helpful to you, um, and also a lot about getting involved and how that helped and educating yourself and being a voice for your children, um, no matter what their age. Um, as they've grown. So 
those are three things that I heard quite a bit um, that have been helpful to all of our panelists. But I do want to ask this question and see um, if we have some responses. So we have um, an ADP kitty patient. It's young, doesn't have symptoms, basically very healthy and not really having any issues right now. And sometimes she feels weird about talking about PKD because there's nothing wrong with her right now. So any tips about how to talk about it without coming across as being dramatic? Such a great question. Anybody have thoughts to share? Can Nicole? I ask what, what age we're talking about? She says young. I can, I can give it a go. Um, hi, I'm Greg. Um, I'm 27 and I've been coming to terms with my PKD for many years. I've known since birth, essentially. And it is, it is really strange to either choose to kind of hide your PKD or to face it head on. And really it changes day to day, conversation to conversation. Um, to be fair though, the threat of kidney failure is something to cause drama of. You're, that that is something worthy of concern. And I, I'm not sure, it, it is hard to bring it up, but in the right company, I don't know, just, I, I think it, people, it does sink in that that is something that is very threatening to my livelihood and my life. Um, I am at work, I'm gonna take this call, but I, I'm not sure, I don't, I ask the same question to myself a lot. So I'm interested in more, Conversational. Well, you take, don't, we want you to take your call, but thanks for jumping in. So that brings up a question too, because I think he said something really important. It changes, you know, from conversation to conversation. So how, how has that been in our panelists experience as far as, you know, maybe did you kind of work up to feeling more comfortable about talking about it? Or did you feel comfortable all, you know, all at once? Like, how does, how do you, how did you react with in that way? I think for me, I, um, it started out really, it, it was a slow progression, but I also wanna just jump to the, the high school students in my son's school because um, he doesn't have it, but we found out through what we did that one of the kids at the school did have it. He wasn't willing to come and talk about it, but there was an instant connection. We're like, wow, this is a small school too, a graduating class of less than 80 kids. And we found out that this other boy had um, PKD as well. and so. I think it was just the um, openness and then also um, talking slowly about, you know, just good health. This is, I eat healthy because I exercise because, and oh yes, I'm doing this because I have this kidney condition that there is no cure for, but I need to be the best that I can be. And so maybe turning it into nutrition and exercise and sports and what you do or, or anything that, um, you know, drinking a lot of water and all the things that we know are good as you're young maybe that turns into a really general conversation about health in general and how important it is to talk about it. That's a very good point, Laura. Thanks for sharing that. Any other I thoughts think, on that? I think, Nicole, that um, it does change. When I was in my 20s um, and 30s, I didn't have any symptoms. I didn't have any problems. And so I got involved with the walks and I raised funds by talking about my mom who um, had PKD and two of my three brothers who had been transplanted. And sometimes people asked me if I had it and sometimes they didn't. If they asked, I was honest. Um, I said that I had it, but that I was not having any problems at that time. And that sort of got me through that early stage. Um, once I hit my fifties and started to go into renal failure, then I found I had to talk about it a little bit more. Um, but it was kind of a gradual, um, I think it depends sometimes on where you are, how willing you are to talk about it. I think that makes sense. We had a comment to someone said, finding someone who has PKD to talk to has also been helpful, which is what we've been talking about when you get involved and maybe go to the walk or go to you know, one of our chapter meetings and meet others, that helps as well. It helps you to talk about what your experience is. Did you guys the, find that to be true? I think the walk is a great first way to get involved. Um, you can kind of go anonymously and meet people and see how you feel about things. Um, we went to the walk for many years. 
um, before I began volunteering and really got involved with the chapter. In our chapter meetings, we have also, um, people have participated and they may have logged in, not turned on their video and just listened. Um, there's no requirement to say anything. And then maybe by the third meeting, they're starting to open up or maybe they've connected with somebody that has like, for me, the PLD conversations are really crucial right now because I'm finding more and more issues with my liver cysts. My liver function is 100%, my kidneys aren't, but I have more issues with my liver. And having those conversations with people has been really helpful for me now that I'm in my 50s and other things are happening with my body. And I'll just say it, perimenopause is sticking in there. And now there's all these other issues that are um, coming up. And I don't know if it's my kidneys, it's my liver, it's my uh, something else. And so, you know, you meet all these people and you can meet one-on-one -on -one after the chat. And, and just connect. And every single month we meet somebody who has said this has helped them in some way. So I just think that is that connection point when you're comfortable that you'll find that completely um, uh, in your heart, it'll feel really good to talk with people. In the Milwaukee chapter, we have people all over the map. We have people that are, you know, transplant patients. We have one guy that's double transplant because his first kidney failed. Um, you know, we have people that are, you know, high functioning, like Meredith, spontaneous, you know, um, mutation. And then some people that have a long family history and, and all these different experiences, some that are on Tovaptin, it's just incredibly helpful um, to hear what they have to teach us. And I'd say the last thing to that young person that had the question, after you first tell everybody, um, you'll know the people that want to learn more and which ones yes. are comfortable learning more. So you'll, you'll kind of feel your way through um, how much to talk about it. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. I think you were talking that one side of your family talks about it more than the other. And so maybe you lean in, you know, to the side that talks about it a little bit more. And then as you find others that want to talk about it, it kind of makes it easier to talk to those people. So yeah. we did get a question. So do you have suggestions on garnering a support network for someone like myself who has a small family um, and she's an only child, which I can relate to. I'm an only child as well. How do you share your story when you've got a small family? Maybe you're an only child. You really aren't starting with your family. Good question. Co-workers, perhaps. Yeah, I was going to say the same. Um, co-workers, I, I invited my co-worker cohorts in different jobs to the walk, and I started telling my story that way. Um, uh, different, uh, my son was younger, the PTA, you know, lots of different kid activities. And again, I would just wear my shirt. And I, there's a shirt that the foundation used to sell, and I don't know, Cole, if we still do. It says, ask me about PKD. And it was in big letters on the back of my shirt. And I would just walk around to festivals and whatever my daily activity and just wear my shirt. And you'd be surprised. I had people come up to me and either ask and said, oh my gosh, I have PKD. And so, you know, it was just being kind of comfortable with that in myself and, um, and trying to connect people. And I would sometimes just throw my, I'm, since I'm a volunteer, I'd have little business cards and I would put those in my bag and hand those out. But it's, it's just that baby steps and, and then it domino effects. All of a sudden you'll meet one and two and five and, or someone might have a kidney problem that's not PKD, but you still connect because of dialysis or whatever. And there's lots of renal failure out there that's not just PKD. And so combining those um, uh, networks together was really helpful for me as well. I would also say um, occasionally I post something on my Facebook page, like a little fun fact or something, um, and see if you get any hits on that. That's a great point. I've done that. The foundation again has always little images and I'll either take them from social media and, or, or forward them and say the same thing because they are, they're, they're, they're nice cartoon like images and they're fun facts. And, um, and then people are interested and they want to help out or they want to ask questions. So just so you know, there's a lot of comments here um, that people are really appreciative of all of you for sharing your stories and being so open and honest. And it's helping, uh, you know, it's helping others um, feel more open, wanting to share. Um, there's just a lot of great comments. If you can uh, multitask, which I'm not fantastic at, obviously, <laughs> because I'm stammering around a little bit. Um, you could take a look at some of these because they're really good. 
uh, we but if people want to connect in the, um, the, the forum chat areas, you can click on our names, I believe, and you can connect with us. And if you want to ask us questions or join other um, things, or I've, I've already had a lot of people ask me about the Seattle chapter and what I do and the things that I've been doing and, um, and some of the other advocacy things. So please feel free to reach out. That's awesome. I was getting ready to mention that to say, okay. you know, please go over to the attendee tab and find people, you know, that you want to connect with, especially those that you might be um, communicating in these chats with, you know, I see a lot of people communicating with, you know, with other people that are in this session. Um, so that's a great way to find someone, you know, that um, also share some of your same experiences. Um, I just wanted to see if we had any more questions. Um, There's some what questions about jobs. Nicole. Yeah, I just saw that, and I, I was going to the same place. What? How, how do you feel about addressing that? How, how do you feel about sharing your PKD story and journey at work? I can speak for Mer for Meredith. Um, it it is a concern, right? It's it's a it's one mm -hmm. of those scary things that you don't know what the outcome will be. So I can't say do it or don't do it. You'll have to feel your own way through that. But for her situation, her, her companies have so far been incredibly supportive. Um, uh, one of the companies, uh, she, when she was working at Coles Corporation in Milwaukee, it was so easy to, to talk about it amongst her coworkers because if she could get five coworkers to join the walk, Coles mm -hmm. would have 500 bucks and each employee would get credit allotted to them for community service. And Coles put a lot of emphasis on that. Pretty unique, I think, but um, it's a real positive. So it, you're just gonna have to feel your way through your company and, and see how it feels to, to either talk about it or not. But you, I think you'll know after a while. It's important if you do start to have as much knowledge as you can. I agree. I didn't bring it up to my employer day one. Um, once I got closer to my employer and I've been blessed by having um, a wonderful employer that, um, you know, going to doctor's appointments, hey, I'm gonna run up to the doctor. I gotta run to my nephrologist, you know, and kind of bring it in that way, uh, kind of bring it in slowly. But mm -hmm. yeah, I definitely didn't bring it up in the job interview. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, that's, <laughs> that's valid. Yeah, I don't agreed. think any of us did. No, <laughs> no. I think for me also part of it was just making sure that my, um, my, my manager, so I, my screen here, I do work at Seattle Children's Hospital, but I'm not clinical. I work in the design uh, side of the hospital and I have been fortunate, this is the last four years and they are very supportive, but I felt it was necessary for some of my coworkers and my manager to know I can't sit for more than 30 minutes without being uncomfortable. So I have a sit stand desk. They've made accommodations if needed. Um, I can go outside and take walks. I can do things. Um, and sometimes I'll sit in the back of, before COVID, I would stand in the back of a room at a, com at a, a meeting, an in-person meeting because I needed to stand up. And I just needed people to know that I'm not being strange or odd. It's just, it's more comfortable for me. So those are when I started talking about it more, but I didn't do it on a day-to-day -day basis. It wasn't about, oh, poor me, or this is going to be bad. It was just, I needed people to know that this is why I was doing what I was doing. But I agree, not day one. It's not necessary. It's just like any other health issue. You need to keep it private to a certain extent, sure. um, but there's, there's, there's avenues that you can share. Yeah, let your good work define you first. Absolutely. And then you'll find the opportunity to talk about it. Right. I think Nancy said in the beginning, you know, everybody's different and you have to do what you're comfortable with. Maybe I'm saying it a little bit differently, but I remember that you said that. So there is a comment here. and Maybe uh, we have a couple more minutes so we could address this. It's hard to share with uh, work and friends because I don't look sick. So they don't believe it's real. Has that been a, um, an issue that's come up for any of our panelists? I, I think you need to be able to explain why you do look fine, but what's going on. Again, that's that whole issue of educating yourself 
so that you can explain it to other people. Um, and I think once you, you explain it, people do understand that a little better. I think it was harder to um, explain as I was in my 30s and maybe my 40s, and it's a little easier now as I get older, um, and I'm not sure why that is, but um, yes, because you don't. I mean, nine times out of 10, no one's going to say something's wrong and realize how, when I say I'm on stage stage four renal failure, everyone just kind of was, what? You know, there's there's just nothing physical about me that says that, um, unless you know me on day to day. So it's, it's just one of those, it's another edge way to educate to say, yes, there's diseases inside. We don't know what people are going through. And it's a good lesson in life to learn about any kind of disease. We don't know what's happening inside everybody. So when you approach people, be kind, you don't know. So I think PKD runs in that same gamut. You just don't know. And so be kind. That's good advice. Mm -hmm. I think that also goes back to what was shared about, um, you know, know know about PKD, you know, educate yourself so that when you have these conversations, because you know people are going to ask questions, they're going to want to know more. Um, it's just our our nature. And so that arms you with with information so that you can keep the conversation going. Any last minute thoughts from uh, any of our panelists? For me, I just want to say be an advocate for yourself. I listened to a couple of, ch couple of chats earlier yesterday or this morning, and um, the amount of information that we have to um, keep uh, control over, whether it's a nephrologist, a general practitioner, for me, my GYN with my, I had a recent scare with being severely anemic and talking to all my um, physicians and keeping that information in my repertoire, so to speak, and sharing with my physician so that they made sure that they had all the information to help me. So important. Please don't count on your own clinical people to feel like that they will have your best, they'll have your best interest, don't get me wrong, but that they have all the information that you have to bring that to all your physicians and they need to talk. And um, I've had a couple scary incidences in the past six months where they weren't talking or I had to encourage them to talk. So um, that's my piece of advice for moving forward with your own health, as well as just being an advocate and don't be afraid to say anything. <laughs> I hear a lot of PKD um, patients use the word uh, warrior, you know, as far as, as, as well as advocate. I hear that a lot and see it on social media. So I think that's what, you know, don't be afraid to talk to others, get your information, get involved. Maybe that's why that's a word that's used a lot. Anybody else have a last minute uh, comment before we end this session? Thank you all. It was great. Yeah. Thanks yes. you. Thanks for having I, us. Absolutely. For I, I, um, I just want to take the, um, the opportunity to say thank you to each one of you for um, you know, taking the, this opportunity to share your story and help others and sharing your experience. Um, we're getting quite a few thank yous in the chat now. Some hearts, I didn't know you could do that. That's cool, I wanna learn how to do that later. <laughs> um, so thanks all of you for joining us. Um, and I hope this has been helpful as you navigate conversations moving forward. Uh, Nancy, thanks for moderating our session. I do want to remind sure. everyone to take the survey. We'd love to get your feedback. And our next session uh, starts at 2.45. It's a breakout, so you can go back to the agenda and pick out which session you'd like to go to next. And you're going to have about 10 minutes, I believe, before that starts. So thank you all so much. Thanks, thanks everybody. Enjoy being here. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye.